Welcome to John Gets Games. Today, I'm bringing you an edited version of the live Q&A vlog that was recorded in January 2021. Uh, I've gone through and cut out all the dead air, and I've tried to focus on the questions that I thought were most relevant overall. Now, I would like to mention that if you'd prefer to listen to this vlog instead of watch it, then you can do so by searching for the John Gets Games podcast wherever you normally listen to podcasts. I'd also like to ask that if you uh, enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one in the future, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with nice bonuses like voting on a few of the videos that I film each month. Okay, let's now get to the questions. All right, the first question is coming in from Hugo Greatest Games, and it says, Lost Ruins of Arnak, is it a great or a good game for you? I love your videos. Um, well, I actually just played this for a second time, finally, like three days ago. I played it once months ago and really enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was a good game at that point, and then Anno 1800 came along, and I just played that game over and over again. Um, but I'm glad I came back to the Lost Ruins of Arnak, because we actually played the reverse side of the board, the snake side, and I really loved that play. I think the snake board is is uh, better overall, at least not necessarily for your first game ever, but um, I think all future games that I'll be playing Lost Runes of Arnak with will be on the snake board. And um, one of the reasons I decided to play this again was because I am trying to put together a top t uh, 10 list for 2020. And uh, I know this is going to be on that list. I was trying to figure out where it would be. And after that play, it, it went a lot closer to the front of the list than it was at before. Uh, it was a lot of fun. So yeah, we'll... Uh, See how, where that actually ends up for the moment, but uh, so far I'd say it's a great game. <laughs> I've certainly really enjoyed it. It's long. It's not the shortest game ever, but it's a lot of fun to actually play. Pennywise326 asks, uh, uh, or says, first of all, I love your channel, and you've taught me a lot uh, about the games I have. Well, no problem. Uh, how many games do you personally own, and which is your current favorite? Um, I recently did an audit. Uh, I think I'm at a little over 200, like 220 games or so at this point. Uh, my current favorite game... Oh, that's tough. <laughs> it really depends on what time what time you get me. Not necessarily that it changes a lot, but it's really hard to come up with a rubric for what my favorite game is. You can make a strong argument that Tichu is my favorite game. You can make a strong argument right now that um, Anno 1800 is my favorite game, maybe. But um, also, I've played Terraforming Mars three times in the last month and had so much fun with it. So you could maybe make an argument for that. I don't know. It, it, it's, it's hard to say. <laughs> that's why making a, a top of all time is really difficult. It's easier to do it for uh, one year at a time. But those are three games that I really like. <laughs> <laughs> that I do own. Uh, all right, Alexi asks, if you are not going to talk about games you don't like anymore or aren't interested in, is there some way we will know uh, that you won't cover the game or didn't like it? Uh, well, one way is if I get a copy of it um, and I don't like it, then odds are good it's going to leave my collection. So I will briefly mention that in the Shifting Shelf segment of my monthly update vlog. Um, a couple of people have sent uh, uh, suggestions, uh, like maybe if I played certain games and didn't want to go into them in detail. Perhaps I just kind of mentioned them in the wrap up of the latest impressions vlog that I did, or I guess good games vlog that they're now called. I might do that. I'm not sure, like not leave it in the main title, but just be like, you know, by the way, I played, you know, Maglev Metro and, and I played it once. I'm not really interested in playing it again because I didn't have that much fun um, or something like that. I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to have to feel this as time goes on. Every time I make a change, uh, I never want to be like, I'm going to do this and that forever. Like it's, it's a shifting thing. And uh, I really do listen to people's feedback. I don't always um, do what they ask me to do, but I, I definitely do listen. So that's something I'm considering. Uh, Joe Chang says, or asks, uh, have you ever had to refilm your playthrough because you missed or misunderstood a fundamental rule? Yes, way too many times. <laughs> uh, I'd say, oh, how many times have I realistically done this? 10? 15 times? Maybe something like that? Uh, it's brutal. It's been a while since I've had to do that. Um, honestly, Doing the tutorial form and not the extended playthrough form for some reason has made that happen less. Uh, almost like maybe I'm more fo focused. But then again, I had a week late last year where I did, uh, I messed up two tutorials back to back and had to refill both of them. Uh, that was Dungeon Decorators and Cartographer's Heroes. Uh, both of which not very complicated games, but I just missed, uh, understood a fundamental rule and had to redo the whole thing. Um, I remember uh, uh, sometimes I catch it and sometimes I send it to the publisher and they say, hey, you got this wrong. I'm not sure if you can fix it. And, you know, if they are tended 
definitive about that, then odds are good I can't. I remember uh, Fates of the Elder Gods, I think it was called. I did a full uh, playthrough for that one. It took a while to record. And while I was editing it, I noticed a mistake. And, oh, man, I was devastated. <laughs> I probably recorded that one for like six or seven hours. And it was the tiniest thing. Like, on your turn, there's like five steps. And I got two steps swapped. And that just broke the whole game. Like, it was just this tiny thing, but it was enough for me to refilm the entire thing. So, yeah, it's happened way too many times. I really try not to make it happen. Uh, these days, I'm very diligent about having the rule book next to me, just off camera when I'm doing these things. So whenever I get to a new section, I'm like, let me just recheck that, read the section again, and then teach it. So I'm much less likely to fumble. And I think that's probably why uh, it's happened less lately. I certainly try really hard to not have it happen. Um, <laughs> one of the best moments in my job uh, continues to be when I get an email back from the publisher after they watched a proof video of the, uh, uh, of the game and say, looks good. Or here's just a couple tiny mistakes. I'm like, cool. Tiny mistakes are easy to fix. I just, I'm always a little bit dreading. They're going to be like, you totally missed this thing. And that's a, that's a bad moment. But it does happen. It just comes along with the job. TC says, a few months ago, you mentioned that many of the content creators were adding midstream ads and that you were giving it a try, but the first month you didn't see much difference. Has this changed? Yes, it really has. And I'm not exactly sure why. Um, maybe it just took time. Maybe I've been better at putting midstream ads in, but uh, the short answer is my ad revenue has doubled since I added the um, the advertisements into the middle of the videos, which is significant. That's um, many thousands of dollars a year, uh, and that's enough for me to keep it, as annoying as it is. It's kind of, you know, there's a, a general norm of board game content creators, what people do. And uh, years ago, no one had ads, and then a couple of people had ads, and then everyone had ads at the beginning, and then no one had ads in the middle, and then one or two people did, and now it seems like pretty much everyone does. And, and that's why it's it did actually end up being a lot more money. Um, I heard it was going to be like two to five times more money. Um, so I guess I'm on the lower end of that, but still doubling the amount of uh, revenue that I've gotten from the ads is significant. I, I mean, that would... Um, um, cover most of my travel costs for conventions for the channel if I went to conventions. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, that, that's why they're still here because they did end up uh, getting a, a pretty big uptick. Also, December got really good and I've heard a rumor through the YouTube mill that um, ad rates go up in December. So it's possible that it will actually settle down to something that's not quite 2x once we get into February or so. Uh, I'll just have to see how that goes. Uh, all right, Anthony asks... I read the Darwin's Journey rulebook you worked on after I saw your impressions vlog on it. Just curious, what was the biggest challenge you faced? What uh, Was it easier than you thought? Um, well, yeah, so um, I actually wrote that book from scratch. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it was a lot more than uh, uh, just working on it. And I think the biggest challenge that I faced is the fact that the first rulebook I ever took on to make is for <laughs> a pretty complex game for a game with like 30 plus different actions. Um, that was a challenge. The biggest challenge in that rule book was taking these 30 actions and trying to organize them well and describe each one of them in a way that didn't seem overwhelming. And if I'm being honest, I think the rule book is still overwhelming. It's, it's far from done. Uh, we're still uh, uh, trying to work on it, make it a little less uh, uh, cumbersome and a little less wall of text. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but was it easier than I thought? I don't know if it was easier. It was a lot more fun than I expected. Um, I I took this on thinking I would probably dislike it, but, you know, you miss all the shots you don't take. And I was very surprised that once I kind of got into it, like the first 20 minutes of writing that rule book were uh, uh, very anxiety making. Like I was just sitting there at a blank page like, what have I done? Why did I say I would do this? I don't know how to do this. Um, but then, you know, I started writing the components list and then, you know, an hour in, um, I was, you know, working on the setup and then suddenly I was like eight hours in or six hours in. I was like, holy cow, time just flew by as I was writing this. Um, and that's a good sign. When time flies by for me, that means I'm usually uh, doing something right. So I think the biggest surprise for me is how much I enjoyed it. Um, it. I don't think it was easier than I thought, but again, there's a lot going on in that game. I'm still working on it too, by the way. Like I just sent a draft of the solo rules over to the publisher and uh, I'm probably going to be working on the rules for the expansion that comes with the collector's edition. So uh, there's a lot to do with it. And uh, it's it continues to be really exciting to be being paid to do this kind of uh, development uh, board game writing work. Uh, Kriti Sharma asks, are you a Lacerda fan? Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about Vital Lacerda. He's designed many games. Um, I am middle of the road on Vital Lacerda games. Um, I would not put any of them in my top 10 list, for example, for, you know, all of my favorite games. Um, they're fine. 
some of them are quite good. Uh, on Mars, I really enjoyed Mercado de Lisboa was very good. Um, I like the Gallerist probably next up. If I was to do a top three Lacerda games, um, uh, Kanban, I enjoyed, but it kind of broke my brain and made me feel stupid. Uh, Lisboa, I started out really liking, but ended up finding the game a little bit uh, more cumbersome than um, I specifically wanted. Uh, so yeah, I, th I respect those designs a lot. They don't necessarily line up with uh, what I want in general. I'm looking for games that are um, maybe a little bit more elegant. Like, I, I take that back. It's not that they're not elegant. It's that Lacerda games, um, in, in a way, actually are kind of elegant because so many different mechanics feed into each other. But it can be a really complex diagram of feeding. And sometimes it's hard to really see how that works until you've played it a couple of times. And I don't think I'm naturally good at navigating those flowcharts, if that makes sense, whereas other people quite are. Uh, my wife and a couple of my best friends uh, like Lacerda games a lot more. Uh, two of my best friends are huge Lacerda fans. Anthony asks, uh, I just got Beyond the Sun and played two two-player games. I'm really enjoying it. Have you played it anymore? How do you feel about it now? Uh, yeah, I've played Beyond the Sun a lot. I think five times last year, plus the tutorial. Uh, strangely enough, every single game has been three players. <laughs> and I play a lot of four-player games. Uh, we just never actually got a four-player game of it going. Uh, I'm still really enjoying it. It's uh, going to be up at the top of my top 10 list for 2020. Uh, the actual place, I got to keep a mystery, but um, it, it's definitely on that list and it's it's near the, the front of the list. Um, I think my favorite way to play it these days is probably the base rules. Uh, I've tried both of the expert variants. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the asymmetry, uh, the asymmetric boards, uh, but uh, I did think the technology market was kind of cool. But ultimately I think I've circled back around to thinking the best way for me to play the game is just um, with the regular rules without any of those extra bells and whistles because the, the game by itself is is very good. And it's great to hear that uh, you've enjoyed it, especially at two players because I've never actually uh, tried that player count. Uh, Rishi says, I can't wait for the Anno playthrough. Really excited. Uh, yeah, I've actually finished that one. It's fully recorded and edited. Uh, I'm just going to have to do an intro and, you know, put a bow on it. So it should be going out in a few days. Um, that one was tough, uh, because that game really does ramp up a lot near the end of the game, but there's so much going on. And I also have so much to do that... I probably couldn't dedicate as much time to it as I was hoping. Like, in a perfect world, I could have recorded, you know, a bit from the intro and then played a bunch and then showed a bunch of stuff near the end of the game, but it just did not make sense with my current schedule and whatnot. So, well, you'll find out. I played a decent uh, chunk of the game, got into the, the middle point, and then kind of talked through how the end game would probably go and where people would actually go from those points. So um, I hope people aren't disappointed that I didn't show more of the end game stuff, uh, but I still showed a lot. And honestly, the video is still pretty long. It's over an hour, even uh, where it's at right now. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting that one out and I hope people are satisfied with it, if that makes sense, especially considering I love the game. So I want people to enjoy the video and uh, give it a shot themselves. Alex asks, uh, I really enjoyed when you did a, a video playthrough of Terraforming Mars. I know your schedule is really full, but is there any chance of getting uh, like one video a month of a not new game? Um, yes, uh, there is actually. Um, and that's entirely because of the uh, contributing producer level supporters of the Patreon campaign. Uh, these are people who um, support the campaign at $20 a month, which is really amazing. <laughs> I mean, all the support is amazing, but um, there are a few people who do that. And for those people, they actually get to suggest entire videos that I make and then they vote on them. Um, they're the reason why I did a uh, let's make a playthrough like behind the scenes video. They're the reason I made that Terraforming Mars video because somebody requested it and they said, I want to see a Terraforming Mars tutorial with as many expansions as you could put in there. So that's why I did it, showing uh, Turmoil and Prelude. I shoved a, lo a lot of stuff in there. Uh, and I can say that this month, it appears that Forenzi is going to win. And that's an old game. That's like an eight or so year old game. And so I will be putting out an older game this month. Uh, sometimes they're top 10 lists last month. Um, actually, I think the previous two months were top 10 lists that were chosen by the contributing producer level supporters. So that's the main avenue for older games being uh, woven in. Uh, realistically, that's probably going to be the way it stays. Uh, right now, I'm doing well enough that my, my schedule's full. I don't really sit around thinking, what am I going to do today? I look at my schedule and I say, wow, I have a lot to do today. <laughs> and uh, it's good that these uh, that there is an avenue for some of these to get uh, woven in. Reishi says, I do like hearing why people dislike games. It's interesting for me to see how different games work for different people. It's amazing the hobby to discuss. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, I, I 
I like the fact that there are avenues for people to talk about positives and negatives. And honestly, my Good Games vlog, once again, is going to be an avenue where I will, I'm not just going to heap glowing praise. It's not going to be just hype central. Uh, I'm going to talk about games that I liked. One of my friends actually asked me, um, what ranking, what, what uh, like, you know, X out of 10 does a game need to be to be covered on my new Good Games vlog? And I thought about it and, and I do try to use the Board Game Geek uh, scale. And so I think I'm going to try to cover every game that would be a six or better, certainly a seven or better, and probably most games it would be a six because a six out of 10 on the Board Game Geek scale says, um, okay game, I would be willing to try it every now and then. So that means an overall positive experience because of course it's higher than five. Uh, so if I'm talking about a game that ends up being a six out of 10, Odds are good I'm not going to be heaping glowing praise on it. I'm probably going to say that I had a good time, but these are the reasons why it's not higher on the list. But it's still, on average, for me, a good game, so uh, I'll cover it. So, yeah, once again, the Good Games vlog is not supposed to be um, just hype central overall. I'm just trying to change things around a little bit so uh, I can still be constructive in a, in a situation that I dread less. Hugo asks, are you a video game fan? Um, not anymore. <laughs> Board games killed video games for me. Uh, I used to be uh, a very big video game fan. Uh, all throughout my childhood, I would play as many video games as I could, uh, which was hard. Uh, my parents had a no consoles um, um, rule, I guess, in the house. So I never had access to like Nintendo or just any kind of consoles inside my house. So that means whenever I visited friends' house, all I wanted to do was play their video game consoles because I was not allowed to play it at my house. Uh, that being said, my dad is a mechanical slash software slash electrical engineer. Uh, make, he, my, my parents ran a, a robotics company, started a robotic company in the 80s. So we had computers around the house. So uh, I got to play a lot of computer games that a lot of people aren't familiar with from like the early 90s. That was kind of the way I cheated to play video games. Uh, and then once I got into college, you know, I was a uh, junior when World of Warcraft hit and that... Um, stole years of my life uh, in a big way. I even tried to get hired at Blizzard because I was obsessed uh, with that game and just, I, I wanted to get into games and I had no idea that I was close. <laughs> I ended up, I'm now full-time in a gaming profession. It's just a little adjacent to video games, but it still, you know, tickles that same part of my brain. Uh, once I really fell into board games, I just lost all patience for video games. It's crazy. I used to love them so much. And now I want to like them. Like I have a Nintendo Switch and usually um, every couple months I get, you know, the urge and I buy a game and I play it for like an hour or two and I just find myself thinking, hey, what's the point? <laughs> no, it's just funny. I just, I can't get engaged to video games anymore the way I used to. Uh, I think just all those dopamine hits have just been fully transferred over to board gaming for me. Rishi asks, uh, any new year ambitions for John Gets Games? Um... Yes, uh, nothing really big uh, as far as like a viewer facing thing. I have some goals as far as how productive I want to be. Uh, last year, I worked a lot, but I could have probably put in more hours um, in, in certain ways. I'm going to try to be a little bit more professional on my side of things to be more productive and to make this, you know, more sustainable. I guess one way to, to say it is in 2020, I was forced into being full time with John Gets Games and I kind of bumbled around and for a while thought maybe I would maybe quit, like I talked about in like September of last year, and they decided I'm not going to quit. So 2021, I guess, is the year where I say, okay, this is my full-time job, and I really take it more seriously, as opposed to being a thing that I found myself in. I'm now saying I'm choosing to make this my full-time job, and uh, we'll see if there's a, what kind of uh, results come from that. But right now, I don't have any specific goals, like a new type of video or, or anything like that. I will say it appears that 2021 will probably have more videos than uh, any other year that I've done before. Uh, and we'll see. I guess my main goal is to try and be more productive while also not burning out. Like make sure I'm in a good space while also being in a productive space. Popover asks, uh, do you like watching movies and can you share some of your favorite movies? Greetings from a Croatian fan. Uh, yeah, I like movies. I wouldn't say I'm like a huge movie fan. Uh, I cannot remember the last time I saw a movie in the movie theater. Uh, so I'm not really that kind of a movie fan. Uh, honestly, <laughs> uh, most of the movies I've seen in the theaters as an adult was with my mom. Uh, my mom loves action movies. She always has. And uh, my dad and uh, my wife, uh, neither of which uh, of them are particularly interested in most movies for the most part, uh, but my mom loves them. Uh, so when my mom was here, my mom used to live about an hour away. She moved away about 
uh, I guess six or seven months ago. Uh, but before that, you know, she was always about an hour away. Uh, I would see a few movies a year with her. Um, and uh, honestly, since she's moved away, I'm now not sure if I'm ever going to make it back to a movie theater because it was kind of like a really fun thing I got to do with my mom. Uh, but um, either way, I'd say some of my favorite movies um, are sci-fi movies for the most part. I mean, I was a huge sci-fi uh, kid uh, from a novel perspective. I used to read insatiably. I, I was really obsessed with Star Wars back in the 90s and all the Star Wars books that came out. And then I kind of moved into hard sci-fi in a really big way. And, and because of that, I think that that's why I love sci-fi movies so much. Like, so some of my favorite movies are uh, Arrival is probably my favorite movie. Perhaps my favorite movie, Interstellar, is also one of my favorite movies. Um, there, there's probably others that aren't really popping into my head right now. Uh, those both pop in. My favorite Star Wars movie, hands down, is Rogue One. I think that movie is incredible. Uh, and a lot of the other ones are kind of <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, in general, uh, I really look forward to sci-fi movies. I'm looking forward to the new Dune because I've read most of those books as a teen. Uh, and um, that that movie looks really cool as well. I guess I like sci-fi movies and I like movies with uh, big twists and uh, strange concepts. I, you know, I really liked Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and Being John Malkovich and that kind of stuff as well. Uh, more so, I guess, in my college years. But um, yeah, th those are the kind of things that I oftentimes uh, gravitate towards. Andy says, I just got Praga Kaput Regni from My Secret Santa. Have you played it yet? I know it was one that you were looking forward to. Yes, I have. Uh, last week, um, I was having a bit of a rough day. It was a weird week. And uh, I jumped onto uh, the Tabletop Simulator Workshop and noticed that the Praga Kaput Regni uh, official mod had been released. So uh, I went on to the chat with all my friends and I said, Praga's out. And so uh, literally an hour later, we played a four-player game of it. I spent about an hour reading through all the rules and then we played a four-player game of it. And we all enjoyed it. Uh, some of us more so than others. I don't think anybody disliked the experience. I, I quite liked it. Uh, I'm looking forward to more plays. I don't think it's going to be like my favorite game. It might be a little bit more uh, emphasizing on some long-term strategic stuff versus stuff I'm oftentimes looking for. Also, this game takes an hour to teach. And I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get that lower. And so that's a decent commitment to teaching a game. But I did quite enjoy it. It's going to be on the top 10 list for the year, even though I've only played it the one time. Uh, and I am looking forward to playing it more. I think it's probably going to be more my liking at three players than four players just because it's longer. It's one of those games that does not scale its length based off of the player count. So a four player game is just going to be, you know, 25% longer or whatever that math works out to be. Uh, and I don't mind games being long, but I think I'd probably enjoy that one uh, with three players instead of four. Uh, so yeah, I'm actively looking forward to playing that one more. Uh, I'm hypothetically supposedly getting a real life copy of that one from the publisher, which uh, does excite me. Like th that is a game that I would like to have in my collection. Uh, Trey says, uh, would you have any tips for learning via rule books for the larger, more time consuming games? Huh, that is an interesting question. Um, I do know that um, a lot of people have trouble with longer complex rule books, and I do know that I probably, just because of the amount of times I've done it, uh, don't really have a problem with that. Uh, I've actually found myself in a situation lately where I really only want to learn games from rule books. Uh, for example, uh, one game that I want to play uh, before I do my top 10 list is Dwellings of Elder Vale. I'm hoping to play it maybe tonight, actually. And I uh, I loaded up a really high quality video that teaches the whole game uh, to try and learn it. And I found myself like 10 minutes into the video feeling you know, like, you know what? I shouldn't watch this video. I just want to read the rulebook. Like I'm so used to reading rulebooks that that's essentially the only way that I feel like my brain can actually learn games now. And, you know, obviously my entire living is based off of the idea that people will learn board games through uh, 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 tutorial videos. And I know that I actually made a tutorial video. I know I could have watched my own video, but I also know they changed a thing or two uh, between my prototype and the final version. So I didn't want to uh, accidentally uh, play with any wrong rules. So... I guess this is a long way of saying I'm not really sure about tips. I mean, I guess the, the main thing is have the game in front of you. Like if you're in Tabletop Simulator, like what I do for the last year is I have the PDF on one of my screens. I have two screens with my computer and I have um, Tabletop Simulator in the other. And every time I get to a rule about something, I find that thing. And I look at that part of the rule, uh, the board, and I pick up the thing and I move the thing around. I try to like map that to my brain with this rule. Um, and I also oftentimes look around and be like, is there a cheat? icon, like somewhere on the board or somewhere on um, the, the cards or something to remind me of this rule. I always like it when I see something like that because that also lets me lock these things in. But I think the, the big thing is have the stuff out. Uh, don't just read the rule book with, with nothing else around. Like really having the components there, like 
I think the best thing to do if you have a, a physical copy is go through the setup procedure first. Like I know a lot of people want to jump right past the setup and get into the meat of how the game plays. But if you methodically go through the setup procedure, you're going to learn what each individual item is. You're going to know exactly where they go. So when you get to that point in the rule book, you're going to be like, oh yeah, the action tokens are over there. I know that because I put them there because the rule book told me to. Um, so I think that's probably my advice. Uh, Meeple of Liberty asks, after playing the game Cafe, are you more curious to try out other games from Portuguese roots? Hello from Portugal. Um, sure. Uh, if I'm being honest, I don't tend to really pri uh, lump games up based off of where they come from. Um, I tend to think about them like maybe designer to designer, um, but I don't really think about like a region specifically on the world as being like they make this kind of game or so-and-so makes other types of games. I, I will say that Pythagoras Games in particular, uh, who made uh, Cafe, seems to put out a bunch of games with some neat ideas. So I'm definitely compelled by a lot of the game designs that, that are coming out of that publisher and, you know, I guess to a larger extent, Portugal, if you want to uh, lump things in that way. Uh, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe there are some trends from a geographical perspective that um, I don't really have my thumb on. Power Fade asks, what is your favorite food, favorite drink of any kind? Um, my favorite style of food is probably Mexican. I really, really like Mexican food. I like spicy food in general. So, uh, you know, spicy Mexican food I love, spicy uh, Indian food I love, spicy Thai food I love. I guess my favorite kind of food is spicy food. Uh, and my favorite kind of drink, I mean, I love beer. Uh, I have probably about one beer a day on average. I usually have a beer with dinner. Um, I love Mountain Dew and Red Bull as well. Uh, but as far as like, you know, uh, alcohol is concerned, um, mostly like porters, dark style, uh, lagers and that kind of thing for beer. I'm not crazy about IPAs. They're fine. I'll drink them. But uh, I generally like my beer to the point where I can't see through it. Or to be super clear, I also love Mexican beers, just like simple beers like Soul and Pacifico. Um, like those really work for me as well. Um, and, and I do love wine. So I guess I have a lot of things out there. Like if I was to put my finger on one thing that I like more than others, it'd be hard to say. Um, red and white wine, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I guess I like non-hard alcohol <laughs> in general. <laughs> uh, Power Fade asks, have you played Star Trek Fleet Captains? Are you a Trekkie? Uh, I haven't? Actually, wait, have I? Let me see here. I have to trust the internet more than myself. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think, I thought I might have, but it does not look like I've actually played uh, Fleet Captains. Um, I've heard of it. One of my friends is a huge Trekkie and he owns it. I thought I might've played it with him, um, but it looks like that's not the case. Um, am I a Trekkie? I'm a passing Star Trek fan, I guess. I wouldn't even say fan. I've enjoyed Star Trek stuff. I've seen most of the movies, and I've seen pieces of all of the shows, um, but it never really grabbed me. Uh, you know, when I was in middle school, uh, there was the Star Trek kids and the Star Wars kids, and I was a Star Wars kid. <laughs> of course, there were other kids playing like basketball and stuff, but I was the kid who would get into arguments with the Star Trek kid about why Star Wars was better. Uh, so <laughs> that gives you a brief glimpse into what I was like when I was 12. <laughs> uh, Penta asks, uh, what are your thoughts about stretch goals for Kickstarters? We, uh, we need them or are they a relic of the past? I don't mind stretch goals at all. Uh, honestly, I know a lot of people uh, have strong opinions about them. Um, and I know that many board game publishers, you know, have already kind of made all the stuff for the stretch goals. And, you know, they are a bit of a, a marketing technique trying to get people to, you know, get more in and feel more vested to try and share this stuff. I mean, I think it's, they're somewhat transparent in that way. Uh, oftentimes, not every publisher, but, but some of them. Uh, but I do know that oftentimes the publishers legitimately need, need that extra money to be able to afford that extra thing because that extra miniature is an extra um, casting mold that has to be made and it makes the box heavier, which means it's going to be more expensive to ship. So I think they make a lot of sense. And I think that's why they're out there. They're, they're great from a marketing perspective uh, and they are really great from a uh, risk mitigation perspective for the publishers so that they don't, overcommit. Um, I, I have no problem when I see a bunch of Kickstarter stretch goals and I have no problem when I see none on a Kickstarter page. Um, I think, you know, people can vote with their dollars <laughs> in that respect. And in general, it seems like people vote to uh, keep things like stretch goals happening. Uh, Neil asks, why do you do an edited Q&A afterwards? Don't get me wrong, the quality is amazing, like everything you do, but we don't want you to burn out. It may be an area that you could cut yourself some slack. Um, well, the short answer for that is, I I really try to respect the viewer's time, if that makes sense. And I always have, like since the very, very beginning of all this, that's why I put timestamps in every single video that I make because 
I am also a board game content viewer on YouTube, and there's often times where I just want to get to a certain point and learn about a certain thing. And so I want to make it easier on the viewer, like put timestamps on the screen so you can go to the points that you want to go to. And when it comes to these live Q&As, well, you know, they're usually about an hour and 10 minutes long overall. And then when I edit it down, they're oftentimes more like 40 minutes. And part of that's because, you know, I want to respect people's time. When, when somebody asks me, what are my opinions about X game? And I have no I, I know nothing about that game. Um, and I maybe t- spend 15 to 20 seconds telling you that I don't know anything about that game. There's really no reason to put that question in the edited version because, you know, I didn't say anything new. And, you know, sometimes there's dead space and all that kind of stuff. And, and honestly, it probably only takes me about an hour and a half to edit one of these live Q&As. So it's not a humongous amount of time to be sunk into it. Um, these live Q&As really are... I mean, these don't make money. (laughs) Uh, These are one of my least watched uh, videos on the channel when it comes to the edited version. Uh, And it's great that there are, you know, 70 people here right now, which is wonderful. Uh, But when you consider like the amount of people that would watch a video that I spent my time recording right now, it's different. But I really enjoy doing these and I enjoy interacting with people. And it seems like, you know, I mean, right now there's 70 people watching this. So hypothetically, 70 people uh, are enjoying uh, uh, gaining this kind of thing. And so like everything, I guess I just have a, a standard that I set for myself. And, and I do try to keep a watch over things to make sure I don't burn out in any specific way. But um, I just, I don't have any interest in putting out raw stuff on the channel. I feel like I never have in the past. And I feel like it would be jarring uh, to do something like that, uh, you know, where, you know, if I have to take a 10 second drink of this water, I don't want people staring at me. I'd rather just chop, chop, delete, and then uh, move on and uh, not have people actually see that. But I mean, I appreciate you asking the question because it is important to always ask these things. I, I really do try to always be backwards looking and say, just because I've done it this way before does not mean I always have to do it more in the future. So uh, constantly thinking about this for all the different things that I do is important. And that's one of the reasons why I've made so many small to large tweaks about my content style over the years. Uh, All right. Brian asks, uh, I hope 2021 is going well so far. Uh, How do you stay so organized? Is it just a personality thing or do you use any apps or uh, something similar to keep yourself straight? Um, That's funny that you say that because historically I feel like a lot of people think, uh, I, historically, I feel like I'm not a very organized person. Um, but, you know, for this job, the, John Gets Games lives in a Google spreadsheet. <laughs> this is the short way to say it. Uh, I call it the, the the board game doc or the BGG doc or BG doc or something like that. And it's got a whole bunch of tabs down at the bottom. One of them is my upcoming schedule. One of them breaks down all the details for all of the vlogs that I do. Uh, and other ones break down even more stuff like stacks, stats that I track and whatnot. But for the most part, I just have a Google spreadsheet that um, is my schedule and I can look at that and make sure I can slot different things in. And I even have areas where when things get tight, like right now my schedule is pretty tight. Um, I've actually gone through and given myself little goals like do this and this on Monday, do this and this on Tuesday, do this and this on Wednesday. And I did that for this whole month and I looked at it and said, okay, I should be able to survive this month. And of course, you know, these are estimates overall, but um, I, I'm trying not to go blindly into these things. Like if I'm about to crash and burn, I'd rather know about it two weeks beforehand and make some changes <laughs> and write some emails as opposed to, you know, just put my blinders on and then crash into a wall. Uh, so that's that's the main thing. I mean, I do track all of my hours uh, just for myself, for personal analytics. And I use a program called, or a website called Toggle, which is free and uh, I've been using it for years. It's great. Um, but uh, from an organization standpoint, just, I just have spreadsheets, a lot of spreadsheets, and they they seem to work. <laughs> All right, Jinray asks, did your copy of Hallertau arrive yet, or is it still underway? It is still underway. Every single day, I refresh my DHL tracking number, and every single day, it tells me the last update was on November 10th. Um, from what I understand, there's actually a, a forum thread on the Board Game Geek uh, uh, page for it of different people like me who order directly from Lookout Spiel, who also have their last update on 11.10. It seems like they put the game on a boat, which is really frustrating for me because I paid $40 for the shipping of that game back in November because I wanted to get it early so I could cover it on the channel because, you know, there's a bunch of hype for it. I spent $40 for them to put it on a boat. That's just (sighs) aggravating, if I'm being honest. And one person did post in that thread that they were like all of us, and then suddenly it showed up on their doorstep. And their, their tracking information had not changed, but it arrived. So hypothetically, at least one person has received their copy of Hallertau that slowly made its way across the Atlantic. So... At this point, I'm now hoping that it'll arrive at any point, but it's been over two months now since it was shipped. And uh, that is not what I would have expected for a $40 shipping. But you know what? Uh, Most of the time, 
shipping goes great. And every now and then, if you do it often enough, you're going to roll poorly. And it seems like that's what happened for Halatau. Harry asks, how often did you back up Kickstarter? What is the latest one that you backed? Um, I used to back a lot of games on Kickstarter. I'm going to look it up now. Oh, there we go. Holy cow. Uh, I have backed 141 projects over the course of uh, 10 years. Uh, the very first backed project that I did was, I don't know, something. It, it was, I think, uh, Alien Frontiers, if I remember correctly. Um, but I don't really back that many the last many years. Uh, there, there was a while where I was backing like one game a week. Um, the, the last one that I did was Neko Harbor, the card game. I thought that looked pretty cool. And Crash Octopus, I backed those around at the same time. And I guess uh, Agropolis, uh, all three of those I backed in in a very short period of time. And then there was like a year before that. And then I backed Isle of Cats. And then before that, it was Terraforming Mars Turmoil. Before that, it was Glenmore 2. So it's not been that many overall um, over the last couple of years. I've definitely tried to scale it back, honestly, because I do receive a lot of board games uh, from publishers these days. So it's kind of changed my incentive structure. Uh, Joe Chang says, a lot of your videos have many parts to it. I think you should split them into shorter, separate videos, and maybe they'll generate more views, money, subscribers. I mean, it's possible that that would, um, but I also don't want to flood people's um, uh, subscription feeds with, you know, three or four videos hitting all of these different points. Um, there was a while where I considered breaking up my impressions vlogs into an individual video for each individual impression that I did, because that for sure would have generated a lot more views. But then I hit an ethical wall where I just felt like that put too much emphasis on what I said in those. Like people are just going to say, look at Jungus Games review of this game when it was just an initial impression of this game. And, you know, initial impressions are what they are. You know, it's the first time that you saw it. Maybe you liked it more than you would on your third play, uh, or maybe you hated your first play, but you'd really like it later on. And I just didn't want to give them undue importance. So I actually decided on something that hurt the channel, honestly, uh, that would get me less views and less subscribers to go with that because of um, my my ethics, my personal ethics, not not um, saying that other people should do things like this, but personally, I didn't feel comfortable with that. Harry asks, do you have any plans to collaborate with others to do re to review together or just to chat? Um, people keep mentioning this to me, especially, you know, in the video where I talked about my subscriber count and views and all that kind of stuff. Um, collaboration would probably be good. Uh, the problem is this. I, I'm, a, I'm an extrovert in general. Like I love board games. That's one of the reasons I love board games so much. But when it comes to John Gets Games, the channel, I have found that I am a bit of an introvert. Like I, I, I make the stuff I make. It's a very controlled setting. I know what I can do and I know how I want to do it. And I, I don't shy away from doing things with other people, but I, I'm not a very creative person when it comes to coming up with good ideas. So there have been several times where uh, um, certain other content creators have told me like, hey, we should collaborate together. And, and my honest answer to them always is, I would love to. Let me know if you have any good ideas. Um, it kind of puts the onus on them, which is unfortunate. And unfortunately, usually... I don't actually hear back because, you know, and I don't blame them because I'm essentially asking them to do work. Um, but since I don't really come up with good ideas, it kind of falls flat, unfortunately. Um, I, I certainly like jumping on as a guest onto podcasts. It, I don't get asked to do that very often, and I would not mind doing it more as long as my schedule permits. Uh, it's probably the best way that I could uh, realistically do this, but we'll see. Uh, I definitely field requests that come in, but but again, I'm not very good at actually sending requests out because I just just doesn't occur to me like what kind of stuff to actually do. I think I get stuck in my box. I am a person that lives inside of a box in every single way. The whole like think outside of the box. I have a very hard time thinking outside the box. Uh, and you know, that's probably part of the reason why some of the art assets you see on screen are the exact same stuff that I've used for like five years on this channel. Brandon uh, says, can you sell me on terraforming Mars? Um, sure. I'll try very quickly. Uh, first of all, the game is not for everybody, but the reason we love Terraforming Mars is because it is such a pure engine building game. Uh, it's a game where it's all about the cards and there are so many cards. It's like almost 200 cards in the base game. So it's all about piecing these cards together to make an engine and no two games are going to be the same. You're not going to be building the same engine each time. Uh, now, I personally think the best way to play is with a drafting variant. So you see a lot more cards. So you have a higher chance of finding cards that'll work with the engine that you're building. But the reason I love Terraforming Mars is because I just love looking down and seeing this thing that I've created, like, you know, pushing hard on plants or pushing hard on um, various other things, you know, buttons or science or all that kind of stuff. It just, every single game feels different to me and the way the, the map lays out and what the map looks like at the end of each game uh, can be quite different uh, just based off of the card draw. So I think I like 
the organic nature of having a map be different every time based off of the random draw from the deck. And I also love the competition of the, uh, the be being able to denial draft cards away from your opponents that you think they might like. I think there's a lot of good competition there. I don't love the direct player interaction, although it's not too bad in this game. And overall, it's really all about the engine building. Uh, as long as you're okay with a bit of randomness from card draw, then um, I think the game could be great for you. Uh, some people hate the randomness, and I don't fault them for that. Some people think it's too long, and I don't fault them for that as well. Although I do think the Prelude expansion is a great way to make the game a little bit shorter overall. Um, again, um, I, I, Terraforming Mars is not for everyone, but for us, uh, we've really liked it. I played it three times in December, uh, and uh, that's saying a lot for it, I think. Uh, whatever asks, hello, I wanted to ask about Through the Ages. I was trying to find a similar game, but not that long because most of my friends uh, tire after three hours and my satisfaction is great though. Um, I have a great answer for you on that. You should try Nations. Nations is an excellent game that is quite Through the Ages-esque. It's also a card uh, based civilization game with an abstracted uh, uh, mil uh, map type presence. There is no map. Um, the rules are simpler. It it's still a complex game, like it's got great decisions. It's not terribly short, but you should be able to play a four-player game of Nations in under three hours for sure, whereas you are not playing a four-player game of Through the Ages in under uh, three hours unless you are all experts at the game. Uh, a lot of people enjoy Nations more than Through the Ages. The military is less confrontational overall, and I quite like them both. In fact, over time, I think, while I think Nations, uh, Through the Ages might be a better game from a mechanical perspective, I think I personally might actually prefer Nations, so give that one a shot. Uh, okay, yeah, that is going to bring this one to the end. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, joining in uh, for the live people as well as everybody who's decided to watch this one later. I hope that you have enjoyed it and uh, keep your eyes out for the next one of these. It'll be happening in early February. I'm not sure exactly what date, but I will announce the date and time in the update vlog that should be going live in early February as well. Uh, these tend to be in the second week or so of the month. Uh, so yeah, that's going to wrap this one up. Thanks for coming by, everybody. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.